So let's come to the topic. Uh, as you can see, it's about laptops, electronic searches at the US border, and I think most of us have actual experiences when making a business travel there. So Seth Schoen is informing us about our rights and their rights, and I think this will be very enlightening. So give him a warm welcome and enjoy the talk. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm grateful that so many people would come on the last day of the camp and at essentially the end of the camp. Um, so thanks. I'm going to talk about what I consider a very depressing topic, and I'm sorry to sort of end the camp for people on a depressing note. Um, one of the great opportunities of working at the Electronic Frontier Foundation is that we have great collaborations between tech people and lawyers. And so we often write articles. Uh, I guess we have some feedback in the back. We often write articles where we have a collaboration between uh, a tech person and a legal person. Uh, Marsha Hoffman is a really wonderful lawyer, a senior staff attorney at EFF, uh, very interested in... Oh, thanks. Marsha Hoffman is a senior staff attorney at EFF. She regrets that she couldn't be here. I hope many of you uh, get an opportunity to meet her, although under good circumstances, rather than uh, being arrested or something. She's very interested in advising people um, from this community on legal issues, uh, reverse engineering, all kinds of legal troubles that you may get into around computing. Uh, and we've been doing research together for a few months about electronic searches at the US border. We're preparing an article. The article is still being edited, so I don't have a PDF to give you but it will be out soon. Uh, it's going to be essentially the long form of this presentation in written form. The article is not going to be very happy. Uh, we've done a lot of legal research. We've had people look through court cases about the border, about the legal situation at the border, and the news is not very good on the legal front. So we're going to present that, but there's no magic thing that makes the legal situation suddenly better. Uh, on the technical side, as technology has advanced, people have more choices, faster networks and cheaper storage, so there are more choices for how you get data from one place to another. Traveling across the border is a really weird situation. It's a stressful situation. Travel is already stressful, even without people asking you confrontational questions and interrogating you and looking through your belongings. And at the border in the United States, we experience a lot of exceptions to the advice that we would normally give people, the advice that everyone learns about how to deal with law enforcement and what your rights are. For example, people learn that when they're questioned by law enforcement, they have a, the right to an attorney. But this right doesn't apply at the border. People also learn that things can't be searched and seized without a good reason, um, and that they have these privacy protections against having people look through their belongings for no reason. But this right also doesn't apply at the border. So in particular, the United States Constitution uh, has this provision that the people shall be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. And in other contexts, for example, your home or when you're walking down the street, the courts have said this constitutes a very strong protection, uh, very elaborate, very powerful limitations on what law enforcement agents can do to you. They can't just look through your things for no reason. Um, this is a provision that goes back very far in the history of the United States. The founders of the United States were very angry about the way that British law enforcement agents would search people's homes without any specific suspicion, without any specific reason uh, to believe that someone was doing something wrong, and the agents would go into people's homes. So the US Constitution from the very beginning provides this protection uh, against what was called a general warrant that would empower people to look through homes and belongings uh, without specific suspicion. Unfortunately, at the border, things are a bit different. Uh, this is a long quotation from a Supreme Court case. This is something the Supreme Court said just seven years ago about the border. The government's interest in preventing the entry of unwanted persons and effects is at its zenith at the international border. Um, for non-native English speakers, that's in astronomy the highest point in the sky. In other words, the government's powers are the strongest at the border, according to the Supreme Court, 
of any kind of situation. Uh, they then quote an older case. Searches made at the border are reasonable simply by virtue of the fact that they occur at the border. In other words, they're not going to engage in this legal analysis about whether a search is reasonable that they would if you were walking down the street or if someone tried to come into your home because you're at the border and they say that's an exception. Uh, and again, this is just seven years ago, so it seems that the Supreme Court is not very disposed to be skeptical of searches at the border. So the way that one of the border law enforcement agencies has interpreted this uh, is by adopting a policy that says absent individualized suspicion, meaning they don't have to have any reason to suspect you. They can review and analyze the information that you're transporting if you're trying to enter or re-enter or leave or transit through or move to the US. And they can look at your documents, books, pamphlets, printed material, computers, disks, hard drives, and other electronic or digital storage devices. Uh, this is one of the two border law enforcement agencies from their policy about border searches of electronics, and the other agency says essentially the same thing. They can review and analyze computers, disks, hard drives, electronic and storage devices, search, detain, seize, retain, and share with or without individualized suspicion. Again, meaning they don't need a specific reason. Uh, now, these are their policies. These aren't court decisions. These are the policies of these agencies. There's often a lot of confusion about these agencies and their role. For example, a lot of people confuse the TSA with the CBP. So I just wanted to go through this quickly so people understand what these agencies are. Uh, TSA is the Transportation Security Administration. That's a law enforcement agency that searches you before you get onto an airplane. Um, although the policies say that you can be searched if you're leaving the United States as well as if you're arriving in the United States, the TSA is not prepared to perform border searches on people who are leaving the United States. There is a theoretical possibility that someone from a different agency could come to the gate where you're boarding an airplane and try to search you when you're leaving. Uh, certainly not the common case, certainly not something that there's infrastructure to do on a large scale. The TSA searches actually are considerably more limited. Um, the TSA doesn't have this border search authority when you're getting onto the airplane in the United States. And it's a totally separate agency. Customs and Border Protection, CBP, is the agency that questions you and searches you when you arrive in the United States, when you go through that immigration checkpoint. Uh, they also drive around in Jeeps and patrol the border. And there's another border law enforcement agency called Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, and they basically do the same thing, except not primary border inspection, but investigating things um, at a higher level or after the fact or things that are already within the United States, but that they suspect involve immigration or customs violations. Um, for example, if you made a practice of smuggling something on a regular basis and you had an organization devoted to smuggling, then ICE might investigate that. Or if you overstayed a visa in the United States, ICE might investigate that. Um, or they randomly decided that they have the power to seize internet domain names. Uh, I don't know. We don't actually think they have that power, but it hasn't stopped them from seizing the domain names. So I should add seizes internet domain names. Uh, yeah, so these are the people who question you at the border. Those are the people who take away your website. Uh, there used to be an agency called INS that a lot of people had heard of, and they've actually been um, abolished. There was a big reorganization when the Department of Homeland Security was created. Um, all, all three of these agencies are within the Department of Homeland Security. OK, to, so to be clear, the person you can count on seeing when you come into the US from abroad is CBP. They're the people who are going to be standing there waiting for you to ask you where you've been. Now, they have a lot of powers under the law. Even without suspecting you of anything, they could temporarily detain you, they could search you, they could temporarily take your stuff away to look at it. They could ask you a lot of questions. Uh, we'll talk in a moment about whether you have to answer the questions. Um, and if you're not a citizen or a lawful permanent resident of the United States, 
they can decide not to let you into the country. And that's really the scariest and most far-reaching power uh, that they have for many people, because they can use that as leverage for other things. Uh, they make the decision about whether a traveler is allowed to come into the United States if that traveler is not a citizen or lawful permanent resident. Now, if they suspect you of something specific, they can do more intrusive searches, and if they have evidence of a crime or evidence that you're violating the customs rules, they can do even more, like arrest you and prosecute you and permanently take away things. But again, these are, these are just the basics without suspecting you of anything, without having any reason. So a number of civil liberties organizations have challenged these powers in court. So far, these challenges have been very unsuccessful. Uh, these are citations to a few of the cases where the courts refused to limit the border search authority with regard to electronic devices. So although the court uh, said this thing in 2004 that I quoted earlier about searches being reasonable simply because they occur at the border, the courts have been prepared to accept the idea that some very extreme and unusual things may still not be reasonable. And so we've made the argument, and other people have made the argument, that searching the entire contents of a device like a laptop is nonetheless not reasonable. Um, in all of these cases, the courts rejected that claim. And we regret that they rejected it, because we think that there is uh, something meaningful about the, the high level of intrusion on your privacy that happens when someone goes through your laptop or goes through your phone. Um, there are two cases that are currently going on, at least um, one involving David House and one involving someone, uh, I think, in New York called Abador. Uh, and these cases are both in court now. You may know that in the US legal system, um, even if one court has decided something, that may be precedent only for a particular region of the United States in the federal court system. And so you can try again in a different part of the country and see if you get a different answer. Uh, sometimes you do. Uh, and so that's essentially what's going on now. We've gotten some bad answers in some parts of the United States, especially the Ninth Circuit, where I live, that includes California. Uh, and people are trying again with some of these questions in courts in other parts of the country, which are not bound by these earlier decisions, to see if perhaps they are more sympathetic to these concerns. So obviously, how much you care about this and how much you're prepared to do and what resources you're prepared to spend to address the risk from border searches depends on a lot of things. And I'm pretty confident that a lot of people would consider it a complete waste of time to do anything about this, whereas other people consider it a major threat and a major thing that they have to pay attention to. So for example, it may vary depending on your citizenship status. If you're a US citizen, then they eventually have to let you into the US, no matter what. Uh, no matter how uncooperative you are, no matter what precautions you've taken, no matter how much you annoy them, they have to let you back into the country. Uh, if you're not a US national, they can refuse you admission. Uh, there's also the issue of time. Is it important to you to get through the checkpoint quickly? Or is it OK with you if they question you for a while, if they hold you for a while? Do you have a connecting flight? Uh, do you care if they're annoyed? Do you care about if you seem to be uncooperative? Do you need your information at all points during your trip, or is it OK if you're temporarily without a laptop or temporarily without the ability to use it? And what kind of internet access do you have while you're traveling? So all these things vary quite a bit from person to person. Now, in fact, searches of electronic devices in particular at the border are very rare. Uh, the American Civil Liberties Union filed the Freedom of Information Act request that showed that there were about 6,500 such searches, that is, electronic searches using the border search um, power between October 2008 and June 2010. So that comes out to about 300 per month on average, or about 10 per day. Uh, in the scheme of the number of travelers who arrive in the United States uh, at points of entry where they're inspected by the government, um, that's tiny. You could think of it as a rounding error. Uh, there are millions of people entering the United States all the time, and about 10 of them per day 
are subject to these electronic searches. And so in that sense, for most people, there are probably other threats that you could devote your time and energy to that would be more productive and more valuable. Uh, but one thing that's come up in discussions here is that attendees of this event are not really a random sample of people traveling to the United States. Uh, and their concerns are not necessarily a random sample of the concerns that travelers have. Um, and notwithstanding that statistically almost no one is ever subject to these searches, I know several people who've been subject to them. And so I know that people here perceive a concern and have a concern, and I think that's not necessarily unreasonable. Uh, and to be clear, the searches could be performed either totally at random, for example, an agent just sees you and says, I feel like searching you. Or they could have heard of you. They could know about you. Um, they could say, you know, when this person comes through, we're going to flag and search that person. And they can do either of those things under the same legal authority. Now, when these searches do happen, they can be incredibly intrusive because the agents could look at all of your electronic stuff and they could copy things and they could copy, you know, your photographs and email and encryption keys and uh, web browsing history. They could copy things that you have that refer to other people, like email from other people or records about other people. While they're doing this, they're preventing you from leaving and perhaps threatening you with various adverse consequences and asking you lots of questions about your travels and maybe people you know and the information on your electronic device. Well, that's a pretty intrusive, pretty scary situation. Now, as I said earlier, the citizenship situation makes a big difference in the sense that if you are a US national, you must eventually be admitted to the United States. They don't have the power to prevent US nationals from returning to the United States. If you're not a US national, you can be refused admission even if you have a US visa in your passport or even if you're coming from a country that's part of the visa waiver program. The State Department is one department of the US government that creates um, immigration policy. The State Department operates the US consulate. They grant visas. They negotiate about the visa waiver program with other governments. The Homeland Security Department is a separate department that makes the decision at the border of whether a person can be admitted or not. And the Department of Homeland Security has made very clear that in exercising that function, they're not bound by the decision of the State Department. So you could go to the US consulate in Berlin and talk to them for a long time and get some nice papers and get this nice visa that says that you can come to the United States. And in principle, under the law, not that this is a common occurrence, but in principle, under the law, the Customs and Border Protection inspector can talk to you can be concerned about something and can decide not to admit you because the State Department's decision does not bind them. So many people are interested in whether they have to answer questions that they get asked or whether they can decline to answer the questions. Um, if you choose not to answer a question that border agents may ask you, there can always be adverse consequences from that. They might temporarily detain you uh, regardless of your citizenship. Um, regardless, of your citizen, regardless of your citizenship status, they might give you more scrutiny on future occasions when you visit the US. So whether you're a citizen or not, if you refuse to answer questions at one time, when you come back to the US later, they might say, you know, uh, let's talk about this occasion when you previously came to the US. Why didn't you answer those questions? Um, it's something that you know, they have databases. They can make notations about what happened. Uh, they can decide whether that's uh, something they want to talk about in the future. And again, if you're not a US national, they could decide not to allow you in and send you back to the country that you came from. Psychologically and socially, if you have true reasons other than your own preference, other than your own choice for not answering a question, that's always easier, and that's always something that the agents will be somewhat more understanding of, not that they'll necessarily be happy about it. For example, if you're a lawyer or a doctor, um, 
or some kind of professional and you have confidential information about other people, you can tell them that you have a professional responsibility to protect that information and not allow them to look at it. Um, if you have an employer that has a policy that you're not allowed to show the information to them, you can say, well, I'm sorry, my employer has told me that under no circumstances can I share this information with you. Now, the agents don't accept in principle that those are actual legal reasons that they can't look at things. You know, they may say, well, we don't care, you're at the border, that doesn't matter legally. But it's certainly a more comfortable situation if you're saying, well, I have this reason, you know, there's confidential information about other people and the trade secret information from my employer and so on, compared to, well, I don't want to. Um, people also wonder about the level of forensic skill and forensic examination that their devices may be subject to. This is a recent filing in one of the current border search cases. Um, with regard to ICE, they have about 220 agents who are certified in computer forensics, which I guess probably means that they took a class. Uh, yeah, they, they took a class on NCASE or something. Uh, I mean, the context of this filing is actually ICE saying, we're not very good at computer forensics and we don't have a lot of people who know very much about it. Um, so you shouldn't be surprised if we want to keep computers for a long time because it's very difficult for us to get around to looking at them or to understand what's on them. Um, and I think you're going to say they also say that they're confused when people do things like uh, dual booting and they don't know how to understand that. Is that? Uh, yeah, I mean, this filing is interesting because it's sort of about the idea that they claim not to be very expert in computer forensics. Uh, now, that's ICE, that's not CBP. I don't know how many agents uh, CBP has who are trained in computer forensics. They can, however, also seize your device and send it to a different agency. Uh, in those policies that I quoted earlier, they say if a device is seized, the, uh, the border law enforcement agency can choose to send that device to a different federal agency for assistance with forensic analysis or decryption. Um, so there's this weird situation where the frontline agents you encounter at the airport almost certainly know very, very little about computers and wouldn't really understand very much about most of what most of you have on your computers. Um, and if they were to take it, they would probably not know how to do a forensic examination. On the other hand, they have the ability to send it off to some other agency, uh, the FBI or any other federal agency that has decryption or forensic capabilities and ask them to look at it. Uh, they could also ask an agent with forensic expertise to come to the airport or border crossing to take a look. Okay, so some basic precautions that I think are valuable for everyone, regardless of whether they're crossing a border or not, regardless of what their attitude toward the border search process is, regardless of their intentions when crossing a border, I think all computer users can benefit from these things. Keeping regular encrypted backups that are somewhere else that you're not carrying with you, and encrypting your laptop hard drive and other storage media. Um, now again, if you're not a US national, there's a possibility in principle that they might say, okay, well, we wanna know your password to decrypt this. And you might say, well, I, I won't tell you. Um, and they might say, well, we might not admit you to the US. So that's an issue. Or if they, um, yeah. But in that case, you could still choose to give them the information if you like. Uh, let me go through this a little bit further and take some questions later on because I might get to the issue. Um, it's also a good idea to keep data on physical media away from the US border entirely if you can. Um, and to try not to do things or say things that will give the agents extra reasons to be curious about you or alarmed about you. Um, one really important point is that lying to them is actually a felony, uh, and you can actually get a prison sentence for lying to these agents. There's a specific provision of the law that forbids lying to them. Um, that provision, uh, 
has actually been used in cases where people were not accused or convicted of another crime. In other words, this is an independent offense to lie to these agents. Um, so for example, we would not recommend pretending not to know the password if you do, uh, because that would seem to be a violation of this. We would also recommend, in general, being polite to the agents, even if you don't want to do what they say. OK, a hobby horse of mine is password strength. Um, I know it's something a lot of people here have thought about. Um, traditionally, people like passwords like these, uh, but if you think about them as encrypted keys, uh, they're really a very tiny amount of information. Um, so back in 1998, uh, there was a great EFF project. Um, maybe John can tell us more of the history about this and the brute force capability curves that people were trying to extrapolate how powerful brute force attacks are, uh, what a brute force attack can do. Well, EFF built a machine that was able to crack a 56-bit DES key by brute force. Um, all of these passwords have far less than 56 bits of entropy. Uh, and this is a machine that EFF built in 1998, right? Not a government encryption cracking machine. Um, depending a lot on the password system and assumptions about the structure of the password, uh, people are already brute force cracking passwords around 10 characters long. Uh, the government probably has a lot better password cracking capability than you do. Uh, so in response to this, for encryption purposes, for encryption passphrase purposes, people have often suggested, you know, taking something like a song lyric or a poem or a quotation or a slogan that's meaningful to you but obscure to other people and modifying it in some way. Uh, and then the idea is that you get a very large amount of entropy. This week, X, uh, XKCD actually picked up this theme. Um, and they pointed out that if you take several words in your native language, which are chosen at random, you can calculate that they have quite high entropy and quite good strength as an encryption passphrase. Uh, and they're likely to be much easier to remember than some weird random thing like this, even if they have a comparable amount of entropy. Um, and they had this great example about, um, what was it about the horse? Uh, correct horse battery staple? Correct. OK. Uh, you should read XKCD from Wednesday. Uh, they make a good point about this. They calculate the entropy. Uh, OK. Now, the XKCD is talking about uh, password strength against online attacks. And there's this gap between online attacks and offline attacks that people don't always understand or appreciate. That is, your Gmail password versus your TrueCrypt password, or your BitLocker password, or your DMCrypt password. They're serving different purposes. And the length that would be appropriate or the length that would be meaningful is different between those cases. So XKCD specifically says that they're talking about online attacks. So they recommend an approach that gets you up to 2 to the 44th possibilities, which is still far too few for disk encryption. But you can still use their strategy, just use more words. right? So they suggest you can choose random words, um, do something like this put them together, uh, you get something like correct horse battery staple, uh, which actually has a lot of bits of entropy. You can calculate with the logarithm down here exactly how many bits and decide whether you think that's appropriate for the brute force resistance that you want. Uh, there's an issue about key stretching, which makes your key more effective. Um, but it doesn't magically make a really terrible password into a really great password. It just adds a few more effective bits if you don't know what kind of key stretching your disk encryption is doing and what kind of security it's giving you, um, maybe don't rely on it to protect you against brute force. OK, so I said earlier that not carrying data with you is a, clear, a clearly useful precaution. Uh, one strategy for this is to make separate operating system images for travel, uh, especially with a laptop. You could do something like make a byte-for-byte -byte copy of your hard drive onto a backup disk, and then install a new, fresh operating system for travel. When you come back, you can do a byte-for-byte -byte copy back onto the hard drive, uh, and your laptop is restored to the state it was before the trip. 
Um, I'm actually doing that personally on this trip. Um, I made an image copy of this laptop operating system at home onto an encrypted disk. When I go home, I'm going to restore it. Um, when I cross the border, I'm going to have uh, either zeros or a uh, fresh operating system install. Um, if you have a computer where you can just slide out the hard drive easily, you could have two hard drives, one for travel, one for home. Um, another thing that a lot of people have tried with good results is take out the hard drive entirely and just use external media to run your operating system. A uh, live CD, a uh, live USB flash drive, an SD card. Uh, Chris Segoyan wrote a few weeks ago that he actually got better battery life running his laptop off of an SD card than off of a hard drive because it didn't have to spin all those platters around all the time. Uh, and then when he is about to get to the US, he destroys the SD card. And that's that. He's not carrying it across the border. Uh, that seemed pretty practical. Another thing that people think of quickly is that you can upload information from one place and download the information in another place. Uh, some devices like Chromebooks sort of try to do this automatically or encourage you to do this automatically. And that can be very nice. Um, of course, if you're storing your data with a third party, you also want to think about the access that the third party may have to your data. Uh, if you're storing information with Google, you may want to think about access that Google has to your data. Or if you're storing information with Dropbox, inf the access to information that Dropbox has. Uh, of course, one thing you can do is encrypt the information separately before you upload it to them. Um, well, there's a long discussion about the comparative threat models between trusting the service provider versus protecting against the border search. Um, but if you have the ability to encrypt before uploading or to upload to your own server, um, it seems like a useful precaution. You can also consider sending either laptops or hard drives or other media in the mail to yourself. Um, now, if you send packages across the US border in the mail, they are subject to search by the customs inspectors. Um, we had people investigate whether this is true of letters which don't have that green customs form saying may be officially opened. Um, and the answer was that it may also be true of letters, not just of packages. Um, but the good thing is that they're not detaining you and interrogating you while looking at the thing. Um, we also believe, although there are no court cases that address this, that the border agents have no authority to alter or bug the equipment crossing the border without a warrant. So if you were to mail something to yourself, um, we believe that in the general case where there is no warrant to search your possessions, that they would not be allowed to install malware or put bugs into your equipment. Um, and again, there's the advantage of not being in the secondary, uh, secondary room, having people ask you these questions while they're looking at this thing. And people, of course, do send laptops and hard drives in the mail all the time. So it's not a particularly unusual thing to do. Another interesting uh, field of research is not knowing your own password when you cross the border. Uh, the most trivial example would be to change the passphrase to something that you can't remember, uh, and then send that over some other channel. There are a lot of ideas about what that channel could be, um, storing it on a server or encrypted email to someone else or encrypted email of parts of it to different people. OK. You could consider the trade-offs. Um, this is kind of neat, because then you could truthfully tell them that you have no idea what the password is. It would be great if we could automate this so that you don't have to do a super complicated thing in order to get the property that you don't know the password. Um, just about a month ago, I think, there was a great paper that uh, was not specifically designed for this scenario, but I think is really useful, um, a system called Keypad. Uh, in Keypad, the files are individually encrypted. There is a server that knows the decryption keys. Um, the server can record when the decryption keys are requested. And then the server operator can decide whether a particular device ought to have access 
to a particular file at a particular time. So essentially, this is something like a DRM system, like a digital rights management system. But it's one that you impose on yourself as a precaution, as a precaution against losing control of the device containing sensitive data. It's also one with no tamper resistance. Um, so it's a purely voluntary thing where the server is able to remotely turn off access and does that in the interest of the end user. Um, it's a cool design. It would be great to have a production implementation of it. If people here are looking for a project that you can do that would help protect people's privacy in the border situation and um, other situations, I think getting a production implementation of Keypad would be great. You would have an auditing feature where you can say, did someone look at these files? And you have a control feature where you can say, you know, I want to turn off access to this thing at this time. If someone is using the device and asks for the decryption key to read this file during this time period, the server should say no and not give it to them. Uh, later on, the server can be configured to say, oh, sure, and then re-enable the access. Um, you can also do the same thing at the whole disk level rather than the per file level. Um, I had an interesting conversation the other day that indicated that Google could actually easily do this with Chrome OS. Um, if you have files locally stored on a Chromebook, there's a very easy design that would enable Google to temporarily make those files unreadable even to the uh, authorized user of the Chromebook and then later re-enable that access. So we want to encourage Google to um, go ahead with implementing that feature. It would be really useful. I mean, the scenario there uh, primarily is you have your own server or your friend has a server, and they help you encrypt things. And you might say, you know, I'm getting on a plane now. Why don't you just turn off my laptop's access to its own files until you hear from me again? And then you talk to them later and say, OK, well, I got through the immigration inspection. Why don't you just turn it back on? Now, one concern, uh, especially for people who aren't using disk encryption, or who are using media that are not encrypted is secure deletion. It's been a concern for a long time. Uh, Simpson Garfinkel did a fairly interesting experiment where he bought a bunch of used hard drives. And he looked at the contents of these used hard drives, buying them at auction sites, at surplus sites, and looked at what was on hard drives that people had discarded. And he found that people had tried to delete their files, and people had tried to format the disk and they hadn't erased the contents of the disk, because on all common operating systems, the default file deletion command and the default format the disk command don't overwrite data. They just mark it as no longer used, no longer relevant, and the data is still there. OK. So you can try to address this by clearing empty space, by making a really big file, because then it overwrites the things that are no longer in use. There are also many tools that do secure deletion. Um, I know John's been concerned about this for a long time, and a lot of uh, academic researchers have been concerned about this. As file systems have gotten more complicated, these tools have come to work less well over time, because modern operating system file systems actually make it hard for you to overwrite a file in place on the disk. Um, they think, you know, we'll get greater reliability if we put the different write operations in different places, and therefore, you shouldn't be able to overwrite the file directly. Well, that means that the secure deletion utilities break. Uh, I can send people a citation about that. Uh, there's a recent academic paper that talks about three strategies for secure deletion on log structured file systems. There's also a recent paper showing that the where leveling on flash drives has the same problem. So you might know that if you overwrite the same place on a flash drive too many times, it will fail. So a lot of file systems and now a lot of the uh, controllers inside flash disks have a feature to put your write operations in different places all over the disk. The idea being that if you're working on a document and you save it 10 times, they want to save it in 10 different places so that you're not constantly rewriting the same spot. Well, it's very good for the reliability of the flash disk, but it means that they just saved your file in 10 places on the disk. Um, so there's a paper from earlier this year that shows that even if you 
at the operating system level, overwrite a block on a flash disk, the flash disk may overwrite some randomly chosen block instead, and the data may still be there. OK. So a lot of people read this paper by Peter Goodman about overwriting things multiple times. Um, it seems that this is now obsolete. Uh, my understanding is that Peter Goodman himself no longer recommends this strategy for most situations with modern magnetic drives. Um, government advice to government agencies no longer recommends this strategy. Uh, for most threat models, it seems to be sufficient on a magnetic disk to overwrite once with DD. An advantage of this is that you might actually do it. Uh, you know, I've heard of people sitting down to overwrite their data 35 times, and they get the estimate back, like, this will be done on Tuesday. And they say, oh, well, I'm flying on Monday, so I guess I'll just cancel it. Well, the single pass DD is something you might actually do, so that's something. Um, of course, it's different from secure deletion because it uh, doesn't pay attention to file system structure. If you just have an encrypted container, like a TrueCrypt container, or an encrypted network disk, there's also an important concern that applications you use or your operating system may leak content or references to content from the encrypted container onto your regular system. Uh, there was a nice paper about this with TrueCrypt with some actual experiments where they made a TrueCrypt container, they made some files inside them, they used uh, the files in an ordinary way, and then they looked for references to the files on the main system, and they found them. Um, most applications are not written with a security model that says that they're forbidden to make a temporary file, or they're forbidden to save a file name in a recent documents list, or they're forbidden to swap the contents of a file to the swap space. Um, so this has really led people to feel that whole disk encryption is very important uh, where available, uh, that you really get more meaningful and protection that you can be more confident in if there's no possibility that applications are off writing references to secret things in unencrypted places. OK, the worst news of the day, uh, I think, is mobile devices. Mobile devices, in general, as we know them today in the field, are basically the best area of communication technology for forensics and the worst for counter forensics. Um, most of them have no full disk encryption by default or even available. Most of them have no secure erase function. Um, it's often very difficult to add that functionality. There are certainly exceptions. Um, there are certainly devices that do have these and do use them. And if your device has them or can have them, I would recommend uh, using them. There is good news that the very most recent release of Android offers full disk encryption. Um, almost no devices have that, but we can look forward to a future when it's a relatively common, relatively available feature. And the thing is that for mobile devices, there are really powerful forensic tools. Law enforcement agents love to seize phones and love to look through the phones. And there are lots of vendors who love to supply the law enforcement agencies with forensic tools to help them look through the content of the phone and present it in a really nice user-friendly way and with databases of how to analyze all different models of phone. It's a really lucrative business supplying uh, mobile phone forensics. So this is kind of bad. Uh, if you have the ability to take a different phone on your trip than the phone that you normally use, although that may be a great inconvenience, it may be a better privacy protection. Um, and I just want to mention cameras as something that people often don't think about in terms of electronic device searches. Um, the policies of ICE and CBP explicitly allow them to search the contents of cameras. Um, cameras also don't provide a secure delete function, and deleted photos can be undeleted often just by running an undelete program on a computer. Um, John Young from Cryptome, right after the September 11th attack, went down to the World Trade Center site and started taking photos with his camera. And a police officer came up to him and said, uh, you can't take photos here. You have to delete them. And so uh, John complied and pressed the delete all photos button and deleted all of his photos. And then he went home and took the SD card and ran undelete and got all the photos back and posted them on Cryptome. Um, so that's kind of neat. but. Uh, 
you know, the border agents can also conceivably do that to your camera. Uh, the solution to this seemingly is to take the memory card out of the camera, put it in a computer, and use a low-level overwrite in the computer if you don't want traces of your old photos to be left on that. Uh, following the wear leveling research, it seems that you should probably overwrite multiple times on flash media. Uh, because the flash media situation and the magnetic media situation are very different. Now, again, all of this is subject to the observation that different people have different levels of concern, and different people are willing to use different levels of resources uh, and time worrying about these things. So when I say, you should take the memory card out of your camera and erase it multiple times in your computer, some people may say, no thanks, and that's fine. Um, I just want to mention this so that people who feel that this is something that they're concerned with and something they want to um, take precautions against, consider it. Um, that's actually all I have for here. So as I said, we are going to publish a PDF with all of this information and other information and more legal citations, um, more discussion in narrative form. Uh, if any of you have comments about things that you think need to be in there, uh, quarrels with things I said, suggestions for how things can be done better. We'd be happy to hear them. Um, Marsha has also been particularly interested in the extended border and protracted border search issue. Um, I didn't talk about this very much, but there's a somewhat unsettled question of how long different agencies can keep seized devices for different reasons. Um, a consequence of that is that if you do have a device seized, and the device is kept for a long time, we would be very interested to hear from you. Um, because that's an unsettled area where we may be able to offer advice or find advice or potentially even engage in legal challenges. Um, and in general, if you have issues about this, um, we'd be interested to hear about them. We'd be interested in improving our understanding. Uh, EFF does operate as a law firm. We can't always give legal advice to everyone, but when we can't give legal advice, we generally try to refer people to someone who can. Um, so I hope that we're able to find people the resources that they need to address this problem uh, as best as possible. Thanks. And, uh, if you I have that, questions, please come to the microphone here. I know that not all of you are going to the United States right now, but uh, I wish everyone uh, safe travels home from the camp. PHP keys on the website. Could you read your fingerprint aloud so that we can verify it? Um, sure. I think I might do that at the end of the question session rather than at the beginning. Hi, Seth. Thanks. Um, I have a comment more on phones, uh, particularly smartphones. Uh, even with things like uh, disk encryption uh, on Android currently, uh, the way most uh, smartphones are currently structured with baselines uh, not being open, uh, I think gives a lot of concern um, for additional forensic techniques that actually may be out of the hands of uh, even sophisticated security consulting firms but maybe not out of the hands of other devoted individuals um, or organizations. Do you have any comments on that or uh, suggestions? I don't even know if Whisper Core and the like can help with that currently. Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the core difficulty which you identify is that mobile devices are not very open in their design or implementation, which makes it both harder to implement security features for them and harder to verify that security features that have been implemented for them actually protect you in different circumstances. Um, I don't think I have really a solution for that. It's really a, the mobile devices are really the worst in this area. Hello? OK. Uh, we have one question from the IRC channel. They are discussing if. Uh, the hidden true crypt container would be a great idea when traveling into the US, and maybe you have some experience with that. I'm sorry, I couldn't understand the question. 
Uh, they want to know if the uh, hidden true crypt volume would be a good idea for traveling into the US. About the true crypt hidden volume, perhaps? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of people are interested in the way that. Sorry? Better here? A lot of people are interested in uh, TrueCrypt's deniable or hidden volume feature, um, which has been promoted as a feature that TrueCrypt has compared to other disk encryption systems. Um, I think that feature is interesting, but I think that it's going to be quite difficult in practice to use the TrueCrypt hidden volume feature in a meaningful, successful way that doesn't involve lying to the agents. And we really don't want to encourage people to lie to the agents because of the extreme legal risk associated with that. Um, so I just think in this situation, it's unlikely that it would provide people with a concrete benefit. I think there are situations where deniable encryption may provide people with a concrete benefit, but I just don't envision how people would use it in this case without sort of directly, blatantly lying to the border agent. OK, uh, I'd like to know if you only get searched if you uh, enter, really enter the US, or if you also can get searched if you like uh, switch the planes on a US airport, or if, you, uh, if your plane stops at the US airport, and then you stay in the transit area, and then you enter the plane again, fly to a different country. So this is a fabulous question, and I uh, um, appreciate this question very much. Uh, the, yeah, uh, one thing I can point you to is attempting to pass through the United States, uh, that the, the search policies apply to people attempting to pass through the US. Uh, maybe more significantly, most countries in the world offer a feature at their international airports called sterile transit, which means that you are allowed to arrive in the country and depart on a connecting international flight um, from the international departure area without passing through an immigration checkpoint. Um, a small number of countries forbid sterile transit and require every passenger to pass through an immigration checkpoint, even if they're in transit to a third country. The United States is one of the countries that forbids sterile transit. Mm -hmm. So all passengers into the United States by air are always required to pass through the uh, border inspection point, even if they have an immediate connecting flight leaving to a third country. So also if it's the same plane? Um, my understanding is that it's even if it's the same plane uh, at least if the plane comes to the airport and allows passengers to get off. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my understanding is that in that situation, people would be subject to the screening. Um, I think you could envision a case in which people are somehow able to be temporarily present in the US and not pass through the immigration checkpoint. But commercial aviation, basically never offers that possibility to passengers. Thank you. Um, to your knowledge, is there any, or practical experience, is there any difference between the borders like by land for Canada and Mexico and the plain borders? So uh, the one thing that people have been interested in is uh, you could enter the United States by land instead of by air. That's the, the basis of your question, right? Um, for example, you could travel to Canada and then travel into the US uh, by car or by train or something. Um, I think that has potential advantages. For example, uh, the general level of um, the general level of scrutiny may be lower. A thing to understand is that the major entry points, even by land, now are staffed by these same Customs and Border Protection agents. They have access to the same computers. They have the same legal powers. Um, they may not be accustomed to performing such intrusive searches. They may sometimes allow people to enter without any particular 
uh, inspection, but I think the trend is that they're trying to make the land borders more like the uh, airports. Now, there are still advantages to entering from Canada. Um, this is kind of a long story, but for example, if you fly from Canada to the US, the US has stationed Customs and Border Protection agents in Canada who perform something called pre-clearance, where they'll interview you in Canada, um, and then the flight will arrive in the US at a domestic terminal with no further immigration check or customs inspection, because everyone has been searched or questioned in Canada. Um, an advantage of this is that the border agents' powers in Canada um, are somewhat less in practice than they would be in the United States. They can still say that you can't come to the country, um, but you may have somewhat greater protection being in Canada. Um, so that may actually be a bit safer or easier in practice if people are particularly concerned about the search or about the detention. Are you aware of any instances of somebody refusing to provide Sorry, are you aware of an instance of someone providing or refusing to provide a key to a border agent who could be refused entry to the United States? Um, uh, someone who's not a US national. Right. Yeah, so this is a great question because I know I said over and over again that in principle, someone could be refused entry for this reason. Um, I don't know of any specific cases. Um, I would love to know how that actually works in practice. In other words, our research is about what the law allows, but I, I don't have examples. Um, I'm sure that uh, most non-US nationals found the process quite intimidating, and um, in most cases, probably cooperated quite a bit with the questions that they were being asked. Uh, I would love to have specific information about what has happened in those cases. I, I don't know either, but thank you. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for giving this talk. I think it's really important that people understand this issue and the sort of powers that the customs agents are asserting that they have. <clears throat> I wanted to follow up by saying that <clears throat> using the Canadian border to enter the United States is preferable, especially for people at the CCC, because the Canadian border allows you, as part of the pre-clearance area, to turn around, even if you're a US citizen, and leave. This is pretty much the only place, if you fly in on an airplane, you don't have the ability to leave. So you are bound by Canadian and US law. They also don't allow you to lie there. <clears throat> but if they were going to take your passport or your electronics and they did not yet have it in their hands, you could simply turn tail and walk out and refuse to enter your country. Um, and then you would be in Canada rather than in the hallway of an international airport. Yes, exactly. You would still be in Canada. Now, that's not necessarily better, as I'm sure Joe will tell you, but it might be better in your case. And if you're afraid that the US is going to bother you or detain you, entering through the Toronto Pearson Airport, um, most of the border agents there are very nice. I know all of them personally. And, um, and um, you know, I, I think that it's important to know that this, this is the one kind of border where if you are concerned, you can actually test the border and what I wanted to ask was, what do you think it is safe to say about your border experiences? I've had quite a few times that they've put gloves on and reached into places that were not particularly for them to touch and had electronics seized and I've been threatened by them as well as detained, I've missed flights, you name it, right? I've got it all. So what can I actually say in, in details? How can I actually talk about this in order to raise consciousness about the fact that these fascist fucking pigs have been ruining my life? Well, <laughs> because I think that I have some good techniques for subverting their control, but I want very carefully to reveal what I've done without putting myself in prison and to be able to, for example, raise consciousness in the United States for better legislation so that we can have a right to use a bathroom, to call a lawyer, to not be threatened where they can't lie to us, these types of things. And, and I don't know how it's legally safe, and I bet it's even less legally safe for non-American citizens. So that's, that's sort of my question. And I know it's kind of a long one with a big commentary, but. Well, I think that 
um, I don't think that there are any legal restrictions on talking about your experiences in terms of direct legal consequence to you, like someone saying, oh, you know, the kind of glove that we use is actually a state secret and you revealed it or something. Uh, or the, the amount of time that it took for a forensic examiner to arrive. Um, I think it's tricky because you have a lot of communities that are actually quite concerned about this, including communities that often are very separate. For example, one of the organizations that was most concerned about this was the Association of Corporate Travel Executives, worrying about the laptops of executives from major corporations and really feeling uncomfortable with the idea that customs agents were going to be going through these things. Um, and the Association of Corporate Travel Executives issued guidance cautioning people against carrying sensitive trade secret information across the border and sort of expressing dismay about these searches. Um, so I think there are actually a lot of different constituencies of people who say we're not really comfortable with the way that these border searches can happen to electronic devices indiscriminately. Um, there has even been legislation introduced in the US that would limit border searches of electronic devices. Um, it hasn't really gone anywhere. The general trend in the US recently has been typically toward more surveillance powers rather than fewer. Um, but it's clear that there are some legislators who are concerned about this. And if you talk about particular scenarios and situations, it's clear that it's something that a lot of people can relate to as a concern. Uh, so I think it would be interesting to try to build bridges. You know, um, you could have an activist and a corporate executive who actually really don't like each other very much. And they're traveling on the same flight, and they both have private information on their laptop, and they don't want the customs agents to look through it for no reason. Um, so I think there are a lot of bridges to be built and a lot of audiences to be reached with this information. Great. Thank you very much, Seth. So this is a question about uh, when you actually get denied entry. So when you get denied entry from the United States, they are required to send you where exactly? Your country of origin that you have citizenship with or where you came? Um, I think that the where you go when you get denied entry theoretically is a sort of logistical thing that gets negotiated in practice. Um, the, I think the common case would be to ask the carrier that brought you there to take you back to where they brought you from. Um, I don't think there's a specific rule that you have to be sent back only to the exact airport that you flew from. Like, if you flew from Frankfurt, and the carrier had a flight back to Paris, and you said, well, I want to go back to Paris instead of Frankfurt. Right. I, I don't well, think they would categorically forbid you from going back to Paris. Right, because, well, I'm a Canadian, and uh -huh. I traveled from C from SeaTac to Frankfurt and then to Berlin. Right. And my path back will be back from Berlin to Frankfurt, back to Seattle, and then crossing by land back to Canada. If I get denied entry at the US Customs, I would much prefer to, uh, to be sent to Canada to rather than to, to Germany. Canada back than to the United States. Since... Right. Um, so because of our focus on electronic stuff, we don't really have any expertise about that. I think it's a fascinating question. Um, my impression is that there might be a way to arrange it with the carrier that you get sent to a country other than the one that you came directly from, but I don't think that there's any guarantee that that would work. But that's just my impression, and we don't really have expertise in that area. OK. Hi. I just had a comment on your suggestion that we use DD to erase drives. Uh, on hard drives, it turns out that the disk drive industry has created a secure erase command that uh, you can get at with the HDPARM command in Linux. And uh, it's two commands, uh, one to set the security password and one to do the erase. And it's, uh, yes. And yeah. It, uh, yeah, I would actually use the enhanced one, the one below there, because it also erases the bad blocks and things like that. And in particular, 
Uh, it's faster than DD because it all happens inside the disk drive. It doesn't have to transfer all those zeros over the bus. Yeah, um, the security erase thing is really awesome. And um, it's kind of strange because I feel like the reason that I haven't been recommending it yet is simply that it seems too technical. But DD seems pretty technical also. So perhaps we should switch to recommending this. It certainly is faster. I've seen, um, uh, I think we may actually have seen the same item about how much faster it is. Uh, because yeah, you don't have to keep telling the drive what the number zero is. You know, you don't have to say, well, now zero, 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 zero. What's that? Dangerous. Dangerous. I have a follow-up question to that, the exact thing. I, I've actually used that, and I bricked drives in a non-erased state, where the drive had a bug in the firmware, and it actually failed to erase, but then was impossible to unlock or use again, and I had to open it in a, in a place where you may not want to open a hard drive and get out something to sand it down. And uh, I wonder if anyone has actually done reviews where we know that those commands actually work on drives, and then someone has read out the drives. Uh, for example, there was an encrypted disk uh, manufacturer that actually wrote the key to the platter, and another one that actually, the password just unlocked reading a different sector, and then decrypted. So if you actually can read without the firmware, you would find that the bytes were not encrypted or that the keys were stored on the platter. And I wouldn't be surprised to find out that maybe the zeros weren't there, but there was like a marker that said it was all zeros. So has anyone done research on that? So one of the, um, one of the funniest things about working at EFF um, is the hilarious things that we have to ask the consumer reports people to write about. Uh, you know, when you're reviewing computers, you should review whether they brick the hard drive when you try to security erase them. But that, yeah, that sounds like a pretty bad bug. Really sorry, but we're running out of time here. Maybe Seth can hold a private conference outside oh, of the sorry. shelter. And we have to clear it before the next talk, so I'm really sorry, but I have to end this talk now. Okay. Thank you for all your questions, and if you have a little time, I'm sure Seth will answer the questions outside. Thank you.